We all live on a false model. Since birth, we were all programmed to think that we lived on a spinning ball earth, flying through space in an endless universe. But now it looks like more and more people are breaking out of the matrix. Something or someone is unplugging humanity from the matrix. There has been a monumental cover-up over the shape of the earth on a global scale. If the truth should ever come out, it will shatter the globe. In this video, when I mention Antarctica or the Antarctic continent, one would automatically have this image in their head. Therefore, I would like you, I would like to ask you to erase any thought or picture of Antarctica from your mind. This will make it easier to understand because the ordinary person on the street do not know the true dimensions of the earth in which we live. This is not the real or the true Antarctic. Only the authorities know what Antarctica really is. In this video, I will be examining the relationship between three men and how they, with the United States government, conspired to deceive the world. One is Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The second person is Thomas C. Poulter. And the third person is James Van Allen. Yes, he of the Van Allen radiation belt. It's very interesting to note that Bird had a very privileged upbringing. In the Wikipedia article about Bird, it says under ancestry. Bird was born in Winchester, Virginia, the son of Esther Bowling and Richard Evelyn Bird Sr. He was a descendant of one of the first families of Virginia. His ancestors include planter John Rolfe and his wife Pocahontas. William Bird II of Westover Plantation who established Richmond and Robert King Carter, a colonial governor. He was the brother of Virginia Governor U.S. Senator Harry F. Byrd, a dominant figure in the Virginia Democratic Party from the 1920s until the 1960s. Their father served as Speaker of the Virginia House of Delegates for a time. Bird's first trip to Antarctic was in 1928. He was, uh, his rank was as a commander and something really strange happened. The, the article says as a result of his fame, Bird was promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral by a special act of Congress on December 21, 1929. As he was only 41 years old at the time, this promotion made Bird the youngest Admiral in the history of the United States Navy. 
So, obviously, he's being handpicked by the elite. Bird returned to Antarctica in 1934. And this time he brought with him Thomas Poulter from the University of Iowa. And he was second in command. And this year they, they set up the base Little America on the continent of Antarctica. Then Bird returned to Antarctica for the third time in 1939 but he had to return back to America as World War II broke out and he was in the uh, in the service of the Navy during World War II and then immediately after World War II in 1946 Bird returned with the Naval Task Force. The article says the expedition was supported by a large naval force designated Task Force 68 commanded by Rear Admiral Richard H. Cruzen. There were 13 U.S. Navy support ships besides the flagship USS Mount Olympus and the aircraft carrier USS Philippine Sea. Six helicopters, six flying boats, two seaplane tenders, and 15 other aircraft. The total number of personnel involved was over 4,000. Birds final trip to Antarctica was in 1955 under Operation Deep Freeze heading it says as part of the multinational collaboration for the International Geophysical Year 1957-58 to Bird commanded the US Navy Operation Deep Freeze in 1955-56 which established permanent Antarctic bases at McMurdo Sound, the Bay of Wales and the South Pole. This was Bird's last trip to Antarctica and marked the beginning of a permanent US military presence in Antarctica. Bird spent only one week in, in the Antarctic and started his return to the United States on February 3rd, 1956. Notice the uh, the wording there. It's not it's not a mistake. It says beginning of a permanent U.S. military presence in Antarctica. That's what it is, folks. It's a military presence disguised as civilian. Surprisingly, the article about Thomas C. Poulter is quite short and to the point. It just basically says that he was responsible for grooming James Van Allen or basically to take over his position later on and that he went with Bird to Antarctic in 1934 as his assistant. Nothing extraordinary here, nothing stands out about his career other than associations with Bird and Van Allen. James Van Allen is an interesting character. He was a professor at uh, the University of Iowa and a professional liar. 
So, Professor Thomas C. Poulter groomed Van Allen to be, to be his successor. And Poulter invited Van Allen to accompany him as a member of the Antarctic expedition, but uh, his parents vetoed the idea. So, he didn't get to go to Antarctica with Poulter and Bird. After Bird's findings in Antarctica, Van Allen was tasked by the United States government to concentrate in the sky. On, a on 5th April 1950, several top scientists, including Lloyd Berkner, Sidney Chapman, S. Fred Singer and Harry Vestine, met, at, met in James Van Allen's living room and suggested that the time was right to have a worldwide geophysical ear instead of a polar ear, especially consider considering recent advances in rocketry, radar and computing. Bergner and Chapman proposed to the International Council of Scientific Union that an international geophysical ear be planned for 1957-58 coinciding with, the, with an approaching period of maximum solar activity. In 1952, the IGY was announced. Please note, very important, Joseph Stalin's death in 1953 opened the way for international collaboration with the Soviet Union. So, from here on end, the United States of America and the USSR worked closely together. They cooperated and to the surprise of many, the USSR launched Sputnik 1 as the first artificial Earth satellite on October 4, 1957 and the fake space race started then. Satellites are in fact raccoons, which Van Allen himself coined. They are balloons with rockets attached and once they reach a certain height, they are fired into the higher atmosphere. After the conclusion of uh, Operation High Jump, James Van Allen was approached by the government and he was tasked with the exploration of the Earth. In 1950, Van Allen invited a group of scientists to his house and he proposed the exploration be called International Geophysical Year, which would start in 1957 and conclude in 1958. There's an article from Time magazine printed in 1959 which states the race into space or space race may be said to have started in Van Allen's living room that evening in 1950. Notice the uh, picture on the right where there are four Soviet scientists visiting Van Allen in Iowa. They were all working together hand in hand. So, from July 1st, 1957 to December 31st, 1958, there was an intense scientific research conducted by the world's leading scientists of the time and 
during this time or prior to this time Van Allen created rockets that were attached to balloons which he called raccoons and they tested the skies through this method and these contraptions would later be known as satellites another character associated with all these is Werner von Braun a Nazi engineer you must remember that the Nazis were also in Antarctic doing research during the 1930s and onward they claimed a portion of Antarctica and named it New Schwabenland after von Braun's capture the Americans smuggled him out of the country and took him to America where he would be reunited with uh, most of his colleagues from Germany one bronze life story would make a great spy movie. One Braun would later would become a prominent member of NASA. Together with his friend Walt Disney. NASA and the Walt Disney Corporation are very much linked they both make great CGI movies today Von Braun is more famous for his gravestone than anything else it's quite possible that he had problems with his conscience it probably weighed heavy, heavily on him that he was deceiving the world and I think his, uh, the message on his gravestone is a message, uh, is a message for humanity. He quotes from Psalm 19.1 which says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Indeed, Werner. NASA was created merely seven months after the conclusion of the International Geophysical Year. Similarly, they rushed to sign the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed a year later in 1st December 1959, after the conclusion of the International Geophysical Year. something stinks to high heaven so in conclusion these are the main events that occurred the US Navy therefore the US government did thoroughly explore the continent of Antarctica. The United States government did task Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, Professor Thomas C. Poulter and James Van Allen to explore the skies. In 1950, James Van Allen did invite leading scientists of the time to his house and proposed an earthwide exploration which would be known as the International Geophysical Year. James Van Allen did create raccoons which were rockets attached to high, high altitude balloons which were later called satellites. In 1954, 
the United States government did invite the USSR to participate in the International Geophysical Year after the death of Stalin. The United States government and the USSR did work together in the exploration of the skies, which would later be known as the space race. James Van Allen claimed to have found the radiation belts around the Earth, but which would later contradict the moon landing a decade later. After the conclusion of the International Geophysical Year, the United States government did create NASA merely seven months after the conclusion of the International Geophysical Year. The United States government did invite many nations of the world and created the Antarctic Treaty on 1st December 1959. I am claiming that the governments of the world did find the edge and the dome and confirmed them in the 1950s, then decided to gatekeep both the Antarctic and the skies or fake space. The Earth is an enclosed system proving creation and a creator.